Welcome to the Deep Dive Spirituality Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Brian Russell, and today it's my privilege to have as my guest, Marnie Swedberg. She's the founder and director of WomenSpeakers.com. Marnie is an international leadership mentor. She's literally spoken all over the world. She's the author of 13 books and the host of her own radio talk show. She's a media expert and a keynote speaker for organizations, both large and small. You'll find this episode to be really helpful from a coaching perspective, from a speaking perspective, from a taking action perspective. We cover a wide variety of topics around leadership, growth, setting goals, and becoming the persons that God created us to be. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did, and I also want to remind my listeners that my new book, Centering Prayer, Sitting Quietly in God's Presence Can Change Your Life, is now available through Amazon and wherever books are found. Let's jump right into the show. Hey, Marnie, welcome to the show. Hey, Brian, great to be here. Yeah, can you just briefly lay out a little bit of background for the audience, like and in particular, kind of trace your spiritual journey that's led you to the place where you're a uh, you know, very successful, um, I think, serial entrepreneur, speaker, you have a TV show, or a radio show, author. Can you just talk a little bit about how the Lord's yeah. kind of led you to this place in your life? Well, I had the amazing privilege of being raised by parents who both loved God and loved each other and loved us. We're really good mom and dad, uh, led us to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ at an early age. And then uh, my mom and my grandma were both uh, very committed to scripture memory. So I have many, many passages of the Bible memorized. And I can even remember as a kid, Brian, uh, Saturday mornings, I would be standing in front of my mom in her bedroom, jumping up and down, trying to say my five verses so I could go out and play. But, uh, you know, having that early start with a loving, compassionate, heavenly father and a personal savior, Jesus Christ, and knowing so much of scripture, I think really was a huge head start for me. And I've had so many challenges in my life and God has been so faithful. So I didn't really learn how to read until I was an adult. I struggled through school, sounding out words all the way. And finally, as an adult, out from under the pressure of school, I was able to relax and start to read. And then I just couldn't stop. Once I started to read, I just went crazy, read everything. I love authors who take the time to write things down. I know you've got a book coming out and I just commend you for that. I I just, I think it's marvelous and amazing that we in this day and age are able to borrow a book from a library or pay $20 and have access to someone's full experience or knowledge that they've put together for us in such a clear, succinct way that I can just sit down and actually get to know an author at a distance in a couple hours. And so I think to me, I think my lack of being able to read going into adulthood and then learning how to read had a lot to do with where I am today. No, that's uh, so exciting. And just, I guess my first question is, um, you know, when I look at your website and uh, we'll give, we'll put that all in the show notes, but it's, it's, it's really easy to remember it's Marnie.com. So, uh, <laughs> Pretty easy. You, you, you know, you, you, you do an array of things. So what, what has set you up or maybe it's your personality and what strategies do you use to sort of keep all of these different lanes that you have mm. in your own life straight so that you can really thrive and flourish and just be the positive person that you are? Yeah. Well, I think uh, one thing I've learned over the years is that everything is a process it takes longer than you think it's going to take. Um, I I remember my first book, it took me two and a half years to write it. And then I had a a publisher, New York publisher picked it up, took another 18 months to get it published. And then I had to learn how to do all the publicity for it. And, you know, I mean, everything is harder and takes longer than you think. But as you go through it, and you get used to this process that this is how it is, even building websites or whatever it is, it's all just a lot of work and you just, you just find where you are. I always say, you know, you're so unique, Brian, this little one inch (laughs) rectangle on your thumb can convict you of a crime in a court of law. It's true. isn't it? (laughs) That's how unique you are. That just, that's all they need that little thumbprint. So 
as you find what God's actually created and designed you to be and to do in the world, and when you just can settle into that and be comfortable with that, you have a good loving father and that he's going to provide for you everything he calls you to do, then, then it just all becomes so much joy. And is it a ton of work? It is a ton of work. I was up this morning at four o'clock starting my work day today because I had to take time out. I got to take time out in the middle to go take care of my grandbaby. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's like, as you figure out who you are supposed to be in Christ and you start living that out, it just begins to flow. And that's what you're really looking for is that flow instead of always the, you know, the hammering, hammering, hammering. And, and, and you're, you're especially, you do this perspective transformational coaching yeah. rooted in scripture. Could you talk a little bit about that and, and what's the kind of unique um twist that you put on in your own ministry and your coaching practice? Yeah. So what happened was I've been speaking since uh, 1996 and um, all over the world, really. And a few years ago, my two adult sons came with me to on a speaking trip and they took some video. And afterwards, they're like, mom, you're like, you, your analogies are amazing. You know, how, how, how did you come up with those? And it's like, well, God just gave them to me or my life gave them to me. I mean, I've been through car wrecks and sinking boats and hospitalizations and ambulance rides and sudden death in the family. I mean, yeah, the list just goes on burglaries, all kinds of stuff. And so as I'm telling these stories and using them as analogies for what God is doing in the world and in our lives, they were like, you've got to maximize that. And so that's where their perspective transformation came in. And what I I've always said is when I'm speaking to groups, what I see is I see light bulbs going on in eyes, just like I never understood that. So let me give you an example of this. So this is a water bottle, right? Okay. And this is a straw. So we all think as Christians that we are supposed to be like the water and people come along and they need something to drink. And so we give them something to drink and pretty soon they have sucked us dry, right? There's nothing left. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm out of gas. I'll say that sometimes. But the reality is that we were never supposed to come up with what's in the cup. Good. We're supposed to be the straw. Mm -hmm. And as we put ourselves into Jesus Christ, then the love of Christ comes through our lives. But let's say that I'm not doing that and I'm putting myself in my own the best I can do. Or maybe right now I'm really angry and bitter or whatever, that's what people get when they suck on my life. So it isn't that we're supposed to produce the goodness in the world. It's that we're supposed to be submerged into the goodness of God and just drink from him. And that changes our entire experience as a Christian from performing and producing for Christ to being his flow through vessel, to be, have this, this privilege to freely partner with him. If he doesn't flow it to us, he can't expect us to produce it because that's the only way he created us to be. So that's one of the analogies I use. Another one here, um, you can see on here, my daughter gave me this. It's, it's got some dolphins on it yeah, yeah. and it's a water, water jug. And um, for the longest time, I really struggled with uh, where the verse that talks about, I think uh, first Corinthians five, that talks about pray without ceasing. And that verse just drove me nuts. Brian, I would try so hard to not stop praying, but then I would have to do my taxes or somebody would call and I would realize an hour or two hours later, oh my goodness, God, sorry, I forgot about you for two whole hours. And I would beat myself up about that. And I was like, why do you call us to pray without ceasing when it's impossible? It's just impossible. So then God showed me the analogy of the dolphin. Mm -hmm. So the dolphin is a water dweller but an air breather. So the dolphin lives its whole life underwater and it does all of its work and all of its life underwater. But every five minutes or so it has to come up for air or it begins to suffocate. Literally, it can't get air. It can't get breath under the water. It has to come up. Well, we were created to be earth dwellers, but prayer breathers. And so what happens is if we can just recognize that anytime we feel any kind of stress or tension coming up in our lives, that is our spirit calling to us to go up for air through prayer. That's good. And it's not that you pray every single second of every single day. It's that like a dolphin breathes, you pray without ceasing. You just never, ever stop being in that position where you can just go right into prayer. That's really beautiful. Yeah. It's so freeing. <laughs> It really is. I love that illustration too, with the, um, with the glass and the straw. It reminds me of, it's really funny this, this year, um, 
some 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 episode in the past, I always pick a word for the the year for myself, and yeah. and this year I picked reservoir, and that comes off mm-hmm. an old metaphor from um, uh, this, uh, this monk from the Middle Ages named Bernard de Clairvaux, and he has this little sermon, and he talks about the need to be a reservoir, not like a and a, not a canal, and his whole idea was you only minister of the stuff that flows out of the right. reservoir, which is and I just love what you the way you that's that was such a great illustration, so. You know, that that was awesome. So um, thank you for, uh, for that. Um, and when when and you're also obviously uh, just a, a fantastic speaker. I'm just um, I knew that from doing the research and just watching you talk. It's effortless. Yeah. There's no ums. There's no ahs. You got the hand <laughs> stuff. You got the illustrations. So you've done a, you've had a lot of experience. You went you run an entire kind of speakers bureau. I think we can call it that for uh, for women speakers. Uh, talk about how you help people to maybe create speeches, create illustrations, and then gain the, cause you got to gain the soft skills also of just being poised and calm yeah. and all the things that you're, you're just modeling for anybody that if you watch it on, <laughs> you can hear it on the audio. If you're on YouTube, you can just see just how poised Mar- Marnie is. And it's like, I'm, I'm getting a little jealous. I got to say already. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I have to tell you that that is not my primary focus because I learned something. So I started womenspeakers.com in 2002. And the idea just came to me in my head. I saw this blue clickable US map and I'm like, what is that doing in my head? And I know you or some of the people listening are like, all of a sudden an idea will come to you and you just know it's from God. You just know, I wasn't thinking anything about that. I don't know where that came from. It just won't go away. So I had this blue clickable map in my head and I'm like, God, what is that about? And I came to understand that there were speakers bureaus out there for all the big name speakers already, you know, the multi-thousand dollars uh, speech speakers, but there weren't so, there wasn't really anything for the small churches, like Mm -hmm. the women's ministry that just wants to have a mother-daughter tea or a retreat or conference for their own ladies. Um, There really wasn't anything to help them find speakers. And so that's what I was supposed to start. And I thought I have no idea uh, what to do with that idea. So I had built a little website for Marnie.com. And so God said, well, you know, you know how to build a website. So just build it with one speaker, you, and just start there. So I did it. I I put it together and I built it. And right away, um, speakers started finding it and planners started finding it. And so it was really blessed by God from just the very beginning. And one of the things that I noticed as I uh, vetted the speakers was that like there was one speaker, Brian, this was, this was a huge lesson to me. There was one speaker who was speaking over 200 times a year at women's groups, especially with Stonecroft. And she would get up and she would stand up. She would unfold her notes. She would put on her glasses. She would read her entire talk. And it was so riveting that you were either laughing or crying the whole way through this whole talk. And she really hardly ever looked up and, and she was doing 200 speeches a year. And I thought, Oh my goodness. Okay. So it's really not about being perfectly poised and having everything so perfect. Is it about preparing? Yes. Preparing to share what God's put on your heart. Is it about doing the best that you can do personally? Yes, it is. It's about giving God your best, but that I really never, after that, I have never focused on helping people be polished perfect Mm -hmm. because I just recognize that God uses wherever you are. And if he puts a calling on your heart to go out and speak, go do it and and you will come along. So what I do offer the speakers is I've got a whole bunch, I think like almost 40 now training modules that are just by title, like how much to charge or, um, you know, what to wear or how to, you know, how to, how to wow an event planner. You know, you don't, you just don't walk in like a prima donna, you walk in like a servant and that's how you wow a planner. <laughs> and so uh, there's all kinds of stuff there that you can find at Marnie.com with the training modules that are just completely free. And that's just available to everybody. That's really cool. And like, just uh, since we have a lot of pastors that are listening. I mean, what have you yeah. learned? And again, I agree that there's different styles and people have to adopt because yes. I was just, I've been watching a I forget some documentary on Netflix and, and they had some clips of Ronald Reagan speaking. Obviously he was pre- um, um, what do they call it? The, the, the thing where you can, the uh, teleprompter, they, they, but he, I was, I was kind of 
I forgot, again, I was a little kid when he was president, but I always remember him being a great speaker. And, and I just noticed he just, he was just reading a lot of his stuff, but he just had the right, right cadence and stuff versus today. Yeah. A lot of folks who do teleprompters and different things, but so I was just reminded of what you said, you can read and a lot of our pastors listen, they use manuscripts and such. So it does Absolutely. kind of depend on on yeah. the skill set. But what, what would you say if you're, I mean, you probably speak to some pastors and coach some pastors from sure. time to time. So mm-hmm. what, what do you wish a pastor knew about speaking that um, mm-hmm. maybe you've learned and you're thinking, and not that you judge, you, of course, you never judge a sermon. You think it's all great, but if like, if you could get into <laughs> some pastors and just talk about like delivery and things, what would be mm-hmm. some tips that you would give for yeah. speakers? Well, I think um, I do. I do pastor leader training, especially internationally. When I go mm-hmm. to impoverished nations, I'll, I'll often do a women's conference, and then I also um, do conferences for the pastors and leaders that lead the women. And um, one of the things that I really focus on is the servanthood of Christ. And one of my favorite exercises to do is to just sit down and to think of every way that Jesus was a servant every way. And when we do this in breakout groups of three or four pastors per little group, we come back with literally hundreds. <laughs> it's amazing. And it's life changing. And I think that if we go into our talks, whether it's a sermon or me giving a presentation or whatever, if we go into them as a servant, they're just to be God's, you know, it's back to this flow through vessel thing again. Am I trying to come up with something really witty and really, uh, you know, I, it's going to go viral or something, you know, or am I just submerged in Jesus and letting the spirit lead what is going to be presented at this particular program? There was some um, right before, right before COVID hit, I did Uh, I solo circumnavigated the globe and Uh spoke 26 times in six countries um, at multiple conferences. And one of the conferences was in Rwanda. And Mm -hmm. I did not know it before I went there, but it was the anniversary, one of the major anniversaries of genocide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the night before, and I had met, um, so I left the U.S. alone and I met a speaker from Australia in Rwanda to do that one. And um, the night before we had talked about what we were going to do with the at the session in the morning and and then I got up and I was praying and God just totally put a different idea in my head and we still didn't even know we were there on this anniversary we had no idea we just went (laughs) where God called us anyway so we get to this conference and um, I start sharing about what Jesus paid for us on the cross and that he came to reconcile. That's why he came was to reconcile us to God and that we could be reconciled to each other. Well, little did I know that about uh, five minutes into my presentation in walked this delegation from the government, including guards and all these people. And they came, actually, we paused the whole program, introduced all of them. They sat on the platform and I was able to share this message of reconciliation. And they really thought that I had done it for them, like specifically for them, for this event. And they thought that it had all been planned in advance because it was such a direct hit for what they needed. So was it what I was planning to share? No, it wasn't. But did God give me the exact message? Yeah, I had already had that prepared for a different time and just pulled it into use. God is so faithful. And Mm -hmm. I think that what I would say to you, pastor, is no matter what you have planned, no matter what you have prepared and and do plan and prepare, but then just be flexible, pliable in the hand of God and let him just flex things around. And I, I, Elizabeth Elliott uh, has a quote that I just love. She defined humility as flexibility and humility is always something, you know, you hear that saying, if you ever once think you're getting humble, it means you're not. Well, I hate that because it's like, (laughs) In all of the other areas of my life, like in patience or forgiveness or whatever, I can actually see progress. I can see fruit. But if you tell me that the only time I can see uh, progress in humility is when I'm thinking of it, I'm going backwards. That doesn't really help. So I really loved her definition. Humility is flexibility. And that's actually something that I can test. I can see how flexible I'm being or how inflexible I'm being. And I can know I'm depending on God more or depending on God less. Yeah, that, that's actually, that's actually really helpful. I haven't, I haven't heard that, um, that, that, that connection. I think it's yeah. really good. So, so talk a little bit about, um, you know, let's go back to your straw illustration and then, you know, you show up and you're doing the circumnavigation. So how does a person, 
and this may go relate to humility even, right? So, um, so how does a person make sure they're the straw and not the water? And what are, how do you mm-hmm. help people to actually position themselves so that they can minister with that wonderful image out yeah. of abundance and not out of their own strength? Right. So if we go back to the work of the spirit shows itself in fruit, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Patience, peace, joy, love, all those. And so what happens is that we find ourselves running out of some piece of fruit. (laughs) (laughs) And when this happened, when I understood this principle, I was hosting in my home, a girls club for girls who were 11 to 15 years old. They would come after school um, three days a week. I would have different girls come in and for two and a half hours, we would work together and we would make meals for families in need. And we would sing together. We would, I taught them how to sew little bibs for the, uh, you know, mom's coming home from the hospital with a new baby. Uh, we just had this time together that we worked well. If you can imagine just me alone in my home with anywhere from five to even 12, sometimes 11 to 15 year old girls who don't know how to cook. And yet we're making a meal for a family who's got to eat it tonight. <laughs> so it was really intense. And uh, at times, you know, they'd be goofing off or somebody would be doing something or if it just wouldn't be going right. And I would run out of patience, Brian, I would like be out out. And so I would either open the fridge door or open a cupboard door and I would just look straight in there as if I was trying to find something. And I would just send this arrow prayer up and just say, God, I am totally out of patience for so-and-so right now, but you're not. So give me some of yours. And he did every single time. And I remember that it wasn't always beautiful. I remember one time after praying that prayer, one of the girls dumped an entire nine by 13 pan of dessert upside down on the floor right in that moment and I just burst out laughing I was like well that wasn't what I was expecting but okay (laughs) and another time the doorbell rang another time something else happened it's amazing you know and I I really feel like this is what humility is Mm -hmm. humility is saying I recognize I'm not God and I need one that's all it is it's just recognizing that you need a savior You need a savior in this moment. And so as we're going forward, I think the way to identify whether the straw is still in Jesus or the straw is into yourself or into something else, is just identify, are you running out of grace? Are you running out of love? Are you running out of patience? Are you running out of kindness? Are you running out of long suffering? You know, it may be that the straw is in the wrong place. Because if the straw is fully submerged in Jesus Christ and you're drawing on him, he simply isn't out of any of those things. That's so good. And, you know, that gets back to the the kind of a classic issue of just having some self-awareness, right? And being really sensitive to the spirit. Um, You know, I I just being myself, I just, when I always, when I, when I think about your your answer, I mean, there's no way to, I mean, it's a great, it's a great answer, but how do you actually help a person to get to the point where they can actually be self-aware enough to actually pick up those kind of signals before they like, um, you know, explode? (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. So actually, uh, like I told you earlier, I was raised in a Christian home. I came yeah. to Christ at age four. I've just been living with this loving heavenly father in a beautiful relationship with Jesus my whole life. Uh, and so ladies would say to me, okay, at the time that this was happening, I was homeschooling my kids. I had, uh, we owned a restaurant that I managed. We owned a retail store that I managed and I was still speaking. So uh, it was like crazy, intense, busy. And ladies yeah. would say to me, well, how do you find time for God? Like, how do you find time for your relationship with God? And it honestly, it didn't compute. It's like, how do I time find time to breathe? Yeah, I, I don't even think about it. I, I am breathing the air of prayer. So therefore it takes no time to breathe. Breathing is just part of what happens to sustain life, right? So, but they kept pressing and they couldn't understand it because they didn't have my experience. And so I did quite a bit of research and I wrote a book called Feeling Loved, Experiencing God That's in the good. Minutes You Have. And in that book, I talk about just what you said. I talk about this, you have this thought that comes and now it starts to spin. And I, ca- I call it, the, I call it the, um, the merry-go-round. You know how when you first get on the merry-go-round, it's going pretty slow and you can hop off pretty easily but as it gets going faster and faster, I mean, you're just hanging on for dear life. You would never want to let go at that point because you'd fly off, you'd get hurt. And so that's how thoughts are. When you learn to grab them quickly at the beginning, you can easily 
you could easily just release them to God and receive his reciprocal gift of love, joy, peace, whatever it is that you need. But as it goes on longer, it's more difficult. And so it's like learning any other habit. It's like learning how to walk or learning how to listen or learning how to ride a bike. You actually have to learn how to breathe prayer. Mm -hmm. And as you do, it just gets easier and easier. So after that book came out, then there was still more questions, but exactly how do you do it? And so then I wrote the book called Flow Through Vessel, which is where the straw analogy came from. And I also use a lot more analogies in that book that help us understand this flow through process. So maybe one more that I'll share right now is Brian, you're wearing a pair of glasses, a corrective lenses. So if you take your glasses off, you have one experience, but if you put your glasses on, you have another experience. Now, did anything in front of you change by you putting the glasses on or off? No, not, not, not literally. Right. No. Just, uh, my perception is, but that's the it, right? perspective yeah. changes. Right. So what happens is we come into another person's life. They're experiencing a hardship. They're, they're having some kind of a question or a challenge. And all we do is we just behave like corrective lenses to help them see mm -hmm. something a little differently from a different angle than they saw it before. And we serve as God's flow through vessel for that. And I always say, you can't give away what you don't have. So so before I can give someone a proper or corrected or a helpful perspective, I have to receive it first. And it's so I have to be in touch with Jesus in order to actually be giving you true help. That's not just momentary band-aids, but that's really going to help change something. No, it's so, it's so good. I want to ask you a little bit about ambition and then about how to yeah. align priorities. I mean, so like, you know, you just said, I mean, you so say you had kids, you're homeschooling, you ran a bit, couple businesses yeah. and you have your speaking piece and anybody who goes on your website, you like, you know, joke to kind of remind me a little bit about what I'd like to become, which a lot, have a lot of stuff spinning at the same time. So how do you discern? I mean, you love the scriptures. If Paul talks about um, godly ambition, like in like Philippians and such, which means it's mm -hmm. probably, or he talks about selfish ambition. I mean, and, but then the obvious, he says, so ambition is not bad. Selfish ambition would be bad, but there's a godly ambition. So how do you, how do you think about ambition, encourage Christians to be maybe more mm -hmm. ambitious versus being passive, but still aligning those things with God? Well, that is such a great question. So I think it goes back to the uniqueness of how you were made. Mm -hmm. um, so if you were actually created to be a jet airplane, but you were trying to be the very best bicycle you could be, you would always be frustrated every second of your life. Now, if a bicycle is doing the job of a bicycle, I mean, that is awesome. It's doing exactly what is needed by the owner of that bike right then. And there's nothing to be ashamed about that. And if a jet plane is doing what it's supposed to do, even though it's flying way high and way fast and way far, and it's way more expensive and all that, there's nothing to be ashamed about that. Mm -hmm. Each is just doing exactly what it was created to do. So when you think about ambition, I think it's a real... Um, it's a real uh, earthly type of um, a concept. I think in God's, I mean, God is so way extravagant. I love how he describes heaven. Uh, I wrote a book trilogy um, last year during COVID called the heaven trilogy. And one of the things I talked about was when God talks about heaven, he is talking in superlatives the whole time because we can't even get our minds around it. It is mm -hmm. so amazingly beyond our thinking. So what does he do? He says things like, um, your tar road equals gold in heaven. So in other words, gold is the least valuable thing in heaven, like our tar. And then the value of stuff goes up from there. Um, you know, pearly gates, you know, you're to take, take your, your, uh, wrought iron fence that's all getting corrupted that's going to be the pearls and the gems and everything like on earth that's like the least thing in heaven and it goes on like that and so i think that when we think about ambition i think what we're doing is we're saying compared to you or compared to them i'm being called to do something that is going to cost more money or mm -hmm. be more visible or require something that they don't have to have. And I don't think God ever looks at it like that. I think he only looks at it like I gave you 10 talents. I gave you five talents or I gave you one talent. Well, what are you going to do with it? That's I think true. that's the only way he looks at it. I don't think he sees it as better, best, ugly, worst, you know, whatever.
I, I just think he just looks at you and says, how did I create you? What are you doing with that? So let me follow up because I think this, this is really important. I, I, I completely agree with everything you just said. And it seems like that the very image that in the scriptures of, be, of being the body is the perfect yes. analogy for ambition. For sure. But what I've noticed, and it's probably true in my own life at certain places, but even, you know, I do some coaching and I, I've noticed a lot of Christians would actually agree with everything you said, but they would say for themselves, I don't know what I was created to do. And a lot of times the very idea of wanting to be a humble and being a servant means a person takes something just because it lets them serve versus something that would let them thrive and flourish. So do you have thoughts yeah, about that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I really believe in doing some serious mission vision work. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I was uh, introduced to it by Lori Beth Jones. Her book, The Path is just fantastic. Yeah, that's and, a great you know, book. you can, I mean, you 20 bucks, you can get this, you can do it on your own. I've got a whole system on my my website that you can do mission vision work on there. It's 99 bucks or you can get it as a member. And um, that is, I do mission vision work, not only for myself, I absolutely am clear about my own mission and vision in Christ, but also for every major project I undertake, I do it again. And now I've got it down so I can do it in about 20 minutes. I can get crystal clear about every project or about every ministry launch. Um, even like uh, when I was circumnavigating the world in, in 2019, I had a mission vision for every conference. Why? Because if you don't know where you're going, if you don't know what you're supposed to be accomplishing, it's really hard to succeed. You think of trying to play any sport and let's just say you're trying to play baseball, but you're on a soccer field. It is going to be so frustrating. <laughs> you know, It's, it's yeah. like you just don't have a clear picture of what you're doing and so i am all about just starting with mission vision and growing from there and it is really truly a gift that we have um and and i think you know if you think about our grandparents or great grandparents like especially for women i mean literally there were three things you could do you mm -hmm. could be a teacher you could be a nurse or you could stay at home with the kids that's it that was that was it three yeah okay you think about it now I mean, even if you're going into one clearly defined um, a, tra a trajectory for a, 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 a college degree, you maybe have to select from 20 to 40 different subcategories in order to get where you're trying to go. So we just live in a whole different time than they lived. And the, trying to figure this out without understanding how God created you and what you're here to do. And the thing is, the blueprint that he's put on, on you inside of you is it's really clear once you understand how to access it it's very clear it's not confusing and it's not hidden and again i don't i don't want to press you for your proprietary tools or whatever i'm just oh, yeah. curious um what like if you were going to start let's just say you're going to work with me on mission vision yeah. could you could, what would be the and again if you can't do this it's cool and i'll just no, cut it out but yeah. um what would be like what's like your first question that you would use to help somebody clarify like um like to get at what i what you were created to do do you have like a favorite coaching question that gets the conversation started yeah i i think i would probably start if i had to just have like let's say i had five minutes with you yeah and that's yeah. all i had yeah. okay i would just i would just say to you brian if you could do anything all day every day for the rest of your life, what would it be? Yeah, it's good, good. I mean, it is so clear when we just, when we humble ourselves and say, you did create me so uniquely that there's nobody else on planet earth like me. And you've got me here to do a particular work in a particular way, reaching a particular group of people on particular days. I mean, when we just acknowledge that God is really truly that big, then we're able to acknowledge that of course, He's the master designer. And of course he, you know, I'm looking behind your head at all those books on your shelf. And I have a stack of books next to me. Every single book understood the purpose for its being written before the yeah. ro wrote it, or else it would just be garbage if it's just all over the place, you know? And yet we don't think God has that much of a design in our lives. It's very confusing to me. It's like, okay, this is really clear to me that God completely knew if he wanted you to be a jet plane or a bicycle before he created you. <laughs> so <laughs> gotta get clear about it and then just run, run. That's good. And so just let me follow up on that. Cause this is, I just, I love that. I just love the answer, even the book piece. Uh, so like, if, like, if you have a book and like, you know, I just finished my book and, um, and it was a, just a blast writing it, but I, you know, I know that 
um, you know, I got crystal clear on it, but then you go through this whole editorial thing and then you sometimes you get even more clear on it. Right. So oh, yeah. what's the process? What's the biggest obstacle? Cause you, you made, the, you made it seem, it sounds, you know, super easy. Like what is it that I could kind of do effortlessly or, and just enjoy doing so, okay, I got that. And, and I'm guessing a lot of people could answer that, but what are the blocks that people run into that prevent them from just owning it then? Sure. Well, a lot of times, a lot of times what you feel like you could do yeah. all day, every day for the rest of your life, maybe either doesn't bring in money yeah. or is somewhere you're not, yeah. or your family maybe doesn't allow that to have happened. I mean, there's all kinds of blocks that can come in, but I would say that it's always going to be, you know, in my head, it's a million things to do written down. It's only 122. So it's still a lot. Like how mm -hmm. it's how to sort it out is still a lot. And I do a lot of work with, with structure and organization and prioritizing. I use a lot of um, Excel uh, just documents where I sort and prioritize mm -hmm. and manage the overflow of ideas, the overflow of, you know, I mean, I think of a pastor, like with sermons, I would think, I know how I am. I, my master document of talk points that I have is, I think, in the seven, eight hundred count now. Um, the things that I can just pull out, you know, right now and use as an illustration or a scripture story or whatever like that. So as you get these ideas, you have to have some way to put them down onto paper. Mm -hmm. And as you're narrowing down uh, your calling in life, like what you're actually supposed to do, it's the same kind of a process. You have what your ultimate goal is, what you want to do. And then you have all these other things that also have to fit in. And I talked to you earlier before we started that it's like being an octopus. It's like, you've yeah. got all these simples out and everything. But that's exactly how God created us to be. We are able to be, I'm able to be a wife and a mother and a grandmother and a friend and a daughter and a sister and a, and a worship leader and a writer and a speaker. You know, I mean, we're able to do all these things. God just created us that way. And so there's nothing wrong with it. Where the biggest roadblock is that we get overwhelmed by it. And so as we come into clarity about how to manage it all, then there, then it surfaces how to go forward. And, and, and you do a lot of work. You have, you even uh, you talk about God's stress management plan, because that's <laughs> going to kick in immediately then, right? So what does that look like? And how do you help people to uh, deal with the reality that you can be really busy? And it's not so much about having a balanced life, because you just named a gazillion things that could just make you right. tired if you just thought about them. <laughs> But, but you, you, you do it effortlessly, you know, it's like the, you know, like you said, the octopus, you got different tentacles. So what do you mean when you talk about God's stress management plan and how can a person implement that? Well, the first principle is believing that just like God has created you with design, that he's created the world on a timetable. So my understanding is that God is outside of time and space. He took the apostle Paul, uh, I shouldn't call him the apostle Paul, he took John, I should say, um, outside of time and space to show him the end of the world. Now, the only way he could do that is if he's already seen the end of the world. So somehow, I, I think of him like a helicopter pilot. And the helicopter pilot is just high enough that he can see the traffic problem up here, even though I'm back here. And so actually he's seeing the future for me. If I keep going straight, I'm going to be in that traffic pile up. And so he can tell me, get off here and go around. So that's kind of how God is. God's like up outside of time and space, but he has us inside of time and space. And he is the micromanager as well as the macro manager. He is perfectly capable of saying to Abraham, uh, your, your offspring is going to be in captivity for 400 years. Uh, well, I mean, Abraham was going to be long gone by then, but uh, God could manage it like that. And and God can manage the micro managing to things in our lives as well. Uh, where are my keys? I mean, he can do everything. And as we recognize this, then we recognize that there has to be time to do everything God created me to do. So there's not time to do everything. There's not time to do everything good. There's not time to do everything everybody else wants me to do. And there's not even time to do everything I want to do. But because God is God, there has to be time to do everything he wants me to do. And it's the same with resources, Brian. So our stress comes from, I don't have enough, fill in that blank, love, patience, time, money, help, whatever it is. <laughs> I don't have enough of this. Therefore, I feel stressed out. At which point we just go straight up for air through prayer 
like, like the dolphin. Okay, I got to come out of the water. I got to come out of being submerged in this point of stress. I've got to get a heavenly perspective on it. Uh, one of my favorite prayers is God talk to me about this from your perspective. So he's way up here. He can see the whole thing. So as we come up out of it for air, for prayer, then we come back into it with a different perspective, recognizing that God is providing everything I need to sustain me right now, tomorrow, the next day, the next year, until he's ready to take me home. Yeah, it's, it, that's, I mean, that's, that's so, that's so good. Um, and I really appreciate the, um, the, that answer. I love, cause this is deep dive spirituality and, you know, and, and that's, um, I mean, that, that's, that's, that is, that is the answer to stay connected and then live out the, this, the abundance that you said, even I love again, the opening illustration was so good with the, with the glass, with the straw in it. So thank you for that. I want to ask you a few kind of concluding questions sure. at this, at this point. So like, you know, what's next for you? Are you going to add like a ninth tentacle on the octopus? I mean, so like, and like where, where are you hoping to be and say like, you know, like five years from now, God willing, well, of course. Yeah. So when I wrote my first book, when I was busy writing um, my first book, I was, I was kind of questioning about like, is this going to be a bestseller? You know how we all want, you know, that seems to be like the goal is to have a bestseller or something like that, to get a lot of attention or something. And what I understood in my spirit was that I was not to be a flash in the pan, mm. that I was supposed to be the person who just consistently over the long period of time continued to grow and to share what I was learning. So I call it living out loud. Um, I just keep learning and growing. There came a time a couple of years ago, um, I'd say probably maybe even five or 10 years ago now, where things were changing so fast and I was getting older and I thought I will never be able to stay ahead of this the changes are too big. They're too fast. They're just, I'm, I'm going to get just washed away and I'm not going to be able to complete this work God put in my heart to do. So what do you hear me saying there? I'm not going to be able to complete the work God put in my heart to do. So who's the focus on here? It's good. Me, right? <laughs> So, of course, I was never created to do it. I was created to stay submerged into Christ who does it through me. That's totally different. And that's what God just actually comforted me. He just was like, you'll know everything you need to know. You're not going to know everything, but you will know everything you need to know to accomplish the work I have called you to do. And so that's kind of just looking forward. I just assume I'm going to be doing more of the same, uh, you know, just going forward and kind of rolling with, you know, the beautiful thing. Um, there have been a couple of times I remember in uh, 2002, I ended up in the hospital a couple of times and I was without a voice for over six weeks. And I love to sing. I've written dozens of songs and I love to speak, of course. And, and so I was just like thinking, I wonder if I'll ever speak again. I wonder if my voice will ever come back. And I was just so sick and uh, just laid out and I didn't know if I'd be able to go on. But one thing I didn't know is that I would be able to pray. No matter what would happen, I could pray. So until God took me home, I would have some source of usefulness in this world, even if it was only laying in a bed, lifting up prayers. And that's what we can know for sure, as until he takes us home, he'll have a job for us to do. And we don't necessarily even get to pick that, Ryan. Uh, but we can know that until he takes us home, there's some reason we're still here. <laughs> You know, that's a, that's a, such a powerful mindset. I mean, that just even reminds me of like the man search for meaning book with Victor Frankl and everything about having that purpose, but it's, you know, and he, and uh, so that's, that's, that's such a great reminder. Is there a book that you'd be afraid to write that you've thought about writing, but you haven't done that yet? I like to ask that sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there is a book that's still out there ahead of me and it's because I'm, I'm heavy. I'm a big person and um, it's the, the book title is a hundred pounds down and it's my journey. Uh -huh. of taking this weight off. But you know, I've been wanting to write that book for decades, and I'm still not there. Uh, I'm still in progress there. So if you say afraid to write a book, that would be the one because there's a lot of um, confusion about why this is such a difficult mm -hmm. aspect of my life. I mean, as you can tell, God has blessed me and I've got a lot of things going that aren't problematic, that aren't challenging. And this one area is just continually quite a challenge for me. And so I keep just running it back to Jesus. But yes, indeed, that one is, uh, that one is the one I really want to write. I would have really loved to write it about uh, three decades ago. And 
and just be sitting in the grace of it, but that is not the case. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for your honesty. And that's, I will definitely, we'll, we'll pray that you can be successful thank to get you. that book thank out there. You. That's good. Love that's good. That. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you can't give away something you don't have. So I have to get there before I can write that book. And, and that is the prayer. <laughs> no, but I, I actually like already that you've, you're taking action on all that stuff uh, too at the same time. So that's, that's, that's good. So what does a typical day look like for you in terms mm. of, um, you know, you staying plugged in the Lord, you've talked about, you know, praying during the day and such, what are some other spiritual habits that you have embedded in your own life that you do consistently that really help yeah. you to show up as the, you know, the person that, that you are here on this podcast, which has just been so wonderful so far. Mm, thank you. Um, I, I host every month, I host a program called 21 day win. Mm. And we all that participate, you select either a habit you want to break or make, and then either that or a project you want to complete. Well, over the years, so I've been doing this for years, um, I've created so many wonderful habits. And uh, so I wake up Every morning as I'm waking up, I, first of all, I don't use any kind of alarm clock of any kind. God just wakes me up when it's time to get up. And I just kick in with the Lord's prayer, except it's a very personalized version of that, um, that I just always pretty much every morning wake up saying, good morning, daddy. <laughs> oh, that's nice. yeah. and then i and then i just as the as the waking up process goes through i'm just grateful that he's way up high and not stuck down here in traffic like i am he's got the good perspective he's got all the resources i need he's got everything in hand already for the day that i haven't even seen yet he's already been there and done that with me and i know it's all, all going to be fine um then i just get up and as i'm doing i i run on an elliptical in the mornings that we have out in our florida room here and as as I do that, I have uh, a prayer sets that I go through. I pray for all the women in the world by country. Um, wow. I go through, yeah, most mornings. And then I have a prayer list that I go through as well. I also um, have, I have a, a saying that I do almost every morning that says a firm decision leads to internal congruence, which leads to emotional mental peace, which leads to energy, which results in positive action. And I just ask God, what is it that I'm supposed to be committing to today? And then I also also ask, um, I have a lot of I am statements and I go through one page of those most mornings as well as a set of questions. And I'm working on a, a book called uh, Instant Relief, uh, which is uh, the questions that I use with my coaching clients, my mentorship group. And I want to make that available to everyone because I, I believe that questions are so powerful when you're in a desperate situation. Yes. Questions are how you surface, how you move forward. But questions uh, questions are also really helpful in keeping you ahead of getting into a desperate situation so that you can kind of just completely avoid some of the landmines you'll otherwise hit. So that's my elliptical. Then when I come in and I'm showering and dressing, then I put on my spiritual armor at the same time as I'm getting dressed. So uh, I take up my sh uh, shield and then I'm putting on my uh, helmet of salvation as I'm doing my hair and then my breastplate of righteousness, my belt of truth, my my shoes of peace and I pick up my sword and I start praying and then that's just the beginning of the day and then the day kind of goes like that um, with different structural things involved in it that are they don't take any longer than if I wasn't doing them but because I've been conscious to add them to my routines they are just part of it. Yeah, it's so good. And I, I just love the the detail you just went in because, you know, I always tell everybody it's like if, 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 if you do, if you create the right sort of habits, you think it's going to take time that you don't have, but it actually expands your time just because you're like you said, you're kind of locked in. And I wanted to follow yeah. up on. Yeah, you know, I loved I heard you saying you basically you use sort of some people call them affirmations. You have these I am statements. Yes, right. and, and then you talked about and you were doing it with your hands even on the video for those who aren't listening, but you're literally putting, getting your shield and your helmet. Are you actually, I'm just curious on the tactics, um, yeah. just to break, are, are you literally visualizing in your mind putting on these things or, or were you just being metaphoric the way you just descri describe it? Can you talk no, a little bit about I that? Actually, um, I can't even tell you an answer to that question. Oh, I think yeah. it's just so internalized for me. I, there was a year I, I had really been studying the, the spiritual armor mm -hmm. and I, I, I listened to MacArthur and I, I read some books about it and I did a lot of Bible studies on it and I was going and going and going. And then, uh, my sister, um, my youngest sister was, uh, the working for an international airline and she had been over in Dubai 
and uh, she was invited out to dinner. So she got her little black dress on and her t black hose and her high heels. And she was down in the lobby at the right time, picked up by the limousine. And as they were driving, 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 she realizes, oh, I don't think this is going to be a formal dinner. And they get there and sure enough, it's a beach party. And <laughs> she's in her little black dress. And, but <clears throat> here's what she said to me that changed, changed everything for me. She said, but you know what, Marnie? I would have rather been in my little black dress at a beach party than in a bikini in a ballroom. Uh, that's and, I thought, <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that's so true. And that then after that, God was like, one day he's just like in my spirit, Marnie, you're studying all this spiritual armor. When are you going to put it on? When are you going to put it on? Yeah, and it was right then that I realized, you know what? I'm just going to remind myself every morning that I am covered by God. And so I just put it on every morning, just like I put my clothes on. And I would no sooner go naked out of my out of my house than I would go naked spiritually into the world. And so that's what I do. It's really helpful. Thank you. And now the the hard question, but I know you're ready for it. I saw your stack here, but it's like, you know, because everybody has all these books. And so oh, if you're going to pick two to three books, so you may, I don't know how many you brought, but like that yeah. have really impacted you spiritually, other than the scriptures themselves, what, what would some of those be, Marnie? Yeah, I think that I, I was telling you beforehand because your new book is on prayer and I just love that. But okay, so prayer is not just me running a laundry list to God. Mm -hmm. It's so much more than that. Yeah. It's me actually having a conversation with the king of the universe, which is absolutely mind bending to me still. I can't even, I just sometimes will burst into tears at this thought <laughs> that God himself will have a conversation with me. I would really want to. I mean, what kind of a dumb God is that? But yet he's not. He's just so loving and gracious. So one of the books that really changed my life is called mm -hmm. Enjoying the Presence of God by Jan Johnson. This book is just, this was revolutionary to me because I kept trying to think of how I could fit God into my life. And she really helped me to understand that God is in my life. And all I have to do is acknowledge it. It doesn't take any longer than not acknowledging it, but it is there. So like the three that are like hugely popular forever long time experiencing God through prayer, Madam Guyong, this one is just huge. Uh, my utmost for his Great. high as yeah. this one is just classic, huge experiencing the depths of Christ, um, brother Lawrence, just, just so, oh no, this is Jean Guyon too. And brother Lawrence says, I thought that I had grabbed that one, but, um, brother Lawrence, what was it? What is that? Practicing the presence, Practicing presence of God. Of God. Yeah. yeah it's huge, a huge. And then I love this, um, 31 days of praise as well by, um, this is by Ruth Myers and it is just so good. These books, all of them, um, when you go through them, it's almost like it's almost like somehow God um, lines up the day you're reading things with what you need that day. It's good. And yeah. I don't even understand how that could happen because some of them are written over a hundred years ago. And so I don't understand, but yet at the same time, that's the power of the word. So love the Bible, of course, memorize it. And uh, that's, that's the main handbook, but these books are all, you know, very biblically sound and yeah, that's good. Amen. Thank you. And uh, kind of last question, um, yeah. where can people find out more about you? Where would you love uh, our listeners to, to, to go to check out more about uh, about you? Yeah, sure. Marnie.com, M-A-R-N-I-E.com. And um, right on the front page there, you can uh, see all my social links. If you want to, if you know, if you hang out at LinkedIn or Instagram or wherever you hang out, just connect with me there. Sure. And then there's also, um, there's a lot of free training materials there, as well as there's a mentorship program or coaching. So whatever you need, I'd love to, I'd love to meet you and follow up. Well, for sure, Marnie.com. I'll put that all in the show notes. I'll also put all the resources, the books that uh, Marnie mentioned for you to access easily. And, and, and Marnie, just want to thank you so much. This has been a really fun conversation for me. I've learned a lot. I really appreciate your spirit. And I also appreciate the real clarity of, 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 of thought and wisdom that you've uh, brought in response to the questions that I raised. So thank you for what you do and for the work that you're doing for the Lord and the world. Thank you. My joy. And it's been so fun to be here. Nice to meet you. And nice to meet you guys in the audience as well. And everybody who is listening here all the way to the end, we're so grateful. And until next time, live by faith, be known by love and be voices of hope in the world. Amen. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the Deep Dive Spirituality Conversations podcast. 
If you found this episode helpful, would you share it with friends or others in your network? And would you consider leaving a review so to help other people find this episode? All of the resources are in the show notes, so I invite you to check those out. And I want to also say, if you're interested in learning about Centering Prayer, my book, Centering Prayer, Sitting Quietly in God's Presence Can Change Your Life, will be released in September of 2021. You can get it already on Amazon, and if you would like information about Centering Prayer and some help getting started, you can also sign up for information directly with me. Go to centeringprayerbook.com. All that information is also in the show notes. I will see you next time.